Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on mental illness, terrorism and grievance fueled violence, understanding the nexus. And of course unfortunately tonight's topic has particular significance given the events in Christchurch on Friday and we would like to uh, send our deepest sympathies to all of those involved, to their loved ones and to the broader Muslim community. The issues that we're going to be talking about tonight uh, may have considerable relevance to uh, what happened on Friday, but I do want to make it absolutely clear that tonight we're not talking about that event. All of the uh, content of tonight was prepared long before Friday. But at this point, I would like to uh, warmly welcome all of you who've joined us tonight for the live activity. And we have had, at last count, we had 2,999 registrations. I'm hopeful that we've tipped over the 3,000. But that is an extraordinary number and really, I think, is a testament to just how important uh, people see this topic as being. A warm welcome also to those of you who are uh, watching us on a recording, and of course a very warm welcome to our panel, who I will, I will introduce in just a moment. Before I do, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our panelists and our participants are located, and I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Now this webinar has been uh, commissioned by the Department of Home Affairs uh, with the idea of providing health professionals with a better understanding of this very complex area and uh, helping them understand better what to do and how to manage these difficult situations when they arise. My name is Mark, Mark Creamer. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Melbourne. And my particular interest is in the mental health effects of trauma. And so generally, I come at this issue from the other side of the coin, helping survivors of terrorism and violence. But as a clinician, and uh, particularly when I was working in public sector psychiatry, from time to time, I would come across people about whom I had severe concerns. And I always found it very, very challenging. And so I'm very pleased tonight to be able to facilitate this panel and to be able to pick the brains of our esteemed panelists. So without further ado, let me introduce them. Uh, now, you all have their webinars and, uh, sorry, their biographies, so I'll keep it very brief. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Innes Rio. Innes is a very experienced general practitioner and also a GP obstetrician at the Royal Women's, uh, as well as seeing a wide diversity of patients in her clinical practice in a community, uh, community health center here in Melbourne. She's also a member of several uh, committees and expert advisory groups. And so it's wonderful to have you with us tonight, Ines. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, is, is your microphone still on mute, mute do you think, Ines? I do. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mark. That's all right. Great pleasure. You're not the only one to have done that. I can tell you I've done that before myself on many occasions. Um, I heard a rumor that you've got a bit of a reputation down at the uh, health center there. Is that right? Oh, probably got a few reputations, probably some good and some bad, Mark. <laughs> I heard you were a bit of a comedian. Oh, um, I think that it's relative, though. Um, I've, to I've told Mark the story that um, I actually came home from work once and said that um, the, the, rep the receptionist staff was saying that I was actually the funniest doctor at, at North Richmond Community Health, and I came home and told my children that, and they said, it must be a very sad place to work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I think a good a sense of, I don't know there's going to be much room for laughs tonight, but generally no speaking, a, uh, a good sense of humor is, is clearly very important. Thank you very much, uh, Ines. Um, our next uh, panelist is Alfred Allen. Alfred is a clinical and forensic psychologist coming to us tonight from Perth. He has a particular interest in professional ethics and also in the intersection between mental illness, uh, psychology, and the law. Uh, welcome, Alfred. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I often like to ask people uh, what they do to uh, escape the stress of work. What kind of uh, strategies do you have to relax? Um, primarily, I like to walk and do hikes and so forth. OK. And I heard a rumor that you've got a habit of getting up at un unrealistic hours of the morning. Unreasonable Sitting, hours. Yeah. If you're on the west side of the country and you're three hours behind, you probably need to do things like that to keep up with what's happening on the other side of the world. 
Well, I, I can see the logic, but I'm very impressed that you would get up at four o'clock in the morning to go for a walk. <laughs> Thank quarter you very much. Four. Oh, quarter past, luxury. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alfred. Uh, our final uh, panelist tonight is uh, Michelle Pate. Michelle is a forensic psychiatrist and a professor in, at uh, Swinburne University. She has enormous expertise in the areas of stalking, fixation, and grievance fueled violence. And she's currently the clinical lead in the Victorian Fixated Threat Assessment Centre. Thanks very much for joining us, Michelle. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, I wonder if I might ask you the same question I just asked Alfred, actually. You clearly work in an extremely stressful area. Um, what, what do you do to relax, to get away from work? Um, what's relaxation, sorry? Uh, <laughs> no, it's um, uh, apart from alcohol. Uh, occasionally do a bit of sailing, but uh, but really no, I uh, I relax by being around people who can have a bit of a uh, a chat and offer a bit of support at the end of the day. I think it's a very very important mm. lesson in there. We won't mm. dwell too much on the alcohol, but uh, oh, being, yeah. being with people who care about you, yeah, I, yeah. I quite agree. Okay, mm. Michelle, thank you very much, and thanks to all our panelists tonight. Can I just, for the part participants' benefit, draw your attention to a couple of technical issues? Um, on the bottom there, you'll see an open chat tab. If you want to send in comments or questions uh, during the course of the webinar, if you click that, you can open it and send stuff. Uh, there's also a resource library tab, uh, which contains a whole lot of uh, good stuff, the slides and the vignette, and, um, and a whole lot of resources. But I'll talk about that again at the end, and I suggest you don't uh, worry too much about that now, because we will send you a link to that after the webinar is finished. You can look at it at your leisure. There's also a technical support tab in case you get stuck. Uh, and we'd be very interested in hearing your opinions, your experience of this platform when you fill in the exit survey at the end of the night. So tonight we are going to explore the topic of grievance-fueled violence uh, and the issues surrounding it. And we'll use our case vignette of Emir as a kind of jumping off point. I would make it very clear that um, this case is completely fictitious. But I think that it does um, raise a number of issues, if you like, that we would want to discuss tonight, including uh, perhaps some broadly held stereotypes and some red flags that we as clinicians might want to be aware of. So in a minute, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to talk briefly in turn about their unique perspective of EMEA's case. And then we'll open it up for a broader discussion. And I hope that at the end of that process, um, that participants will have uh, a better understanding of the link, albeit the non-causal link, uh, between mental illness, extremist ideology, and abnormal fixation, that uh, participants will be better able to identify fixated behavior, radicalization to violent extremism, and the potential for grievance-fueled violence. And finally, that um, we'll all have a much better awareness of the referral pathways, where we can refer to and what kind of steps we should be taking if we're concerned that a patient might be heading down this track. OK, so without further ado now, I'd like to hand over to our first panelist, to Innes, and ask Innes to um, talk a little bit about her reactions to Emir's story, uh, particularly from a GP perspective. Um, over to you, Innes. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I think I'll just walk through the journey that I actually see uh, and me being on at the moment. But to start off with, the great privilege of actually being a general practitioner is that you really do get to know a person over time and in the context of their own life and their own journey. Um, and I see, particularly with Amir, you've also seen the journey from other people's perspectives. Certainly you've got a long-term relationship with his mother, Layla, and you've also seen from other health pr practitioners' point of view how he's presented and what issues have been from their lens. And so you get a sense of his life over time and also his potential, uh, his health, but also his illness over a, a long time period and the effect on himself and also the effect on others. So just to get a sense from my perspective how I would regard sort of walking through the journey from an outside perspective. You've got a young man with uh, schizoaffective disorder, meaning he has both schizophrenic component of delusions or hallucinations, but also an affective or a mood disorder, which I suspect is um, bipolar disorder. It'd be interesting to see what Michelle says later. 
And it's not clear from the history, from my point of view, what these delusions and hallucinations are. However, given the threatening nature to his sister in particular and some of the issues involved with some of the violence, I do suspect that there might be a paranoid component involved there. There's a number of elements in Amir's mental health history that actually indicate that both the severity and risk from my point of view as a general practitioner. He's been violent on a number of occasions, police have been called, he's had inpatient care, he's now in a community treatment order. And there, so all of those indicate to me that there's quite a severe illness, mental health illness there. And there's also very significant wide ranging effects on his life. He's stopped his education, he's not working, and there's very significant sort of familial disruption and disharmony. And additional to those, he doesn't actually accept that he's unwell. He doesn't own his own actions, he blames others, he feels that he has an insight that others don't have. Um, he doesn't feel he's unwell. So all of those actually indicate to me the seriousness of his disease. And he's left with both positive and negative symptoms of his disease, which, which are both causing illness. Um, the positive features of his disease, the delusions and hallucinations, have decreased with time, and thus the diagnosis of residual schizoaffective disorder. However, he's left with these predominant negative effects, um, which have been described as the blunted emotion, the social withdrawal, in an effect, the lack of full engagement in a meaningful life. But I think it's really important also for a new to actually understand that he's got several protective factors. And it's those protective factors over time that will help safety net him, but also help you work with him, his family and his team to actually help him. He's got a place to sleep at night. He's got a safe place to sleep at night. And that's really meaningful. Many people in this situation don't. He has um, the oversight care and very much the love of his mother, Layla, and I suspect other family members as well. And he has an ongoing care and relationship with a GP, with me or his GP. Um, and he adheres to his medication. So there's a number of positive factors that actually can be worked on. So I suppose from my point of view as a GP, I wonder, you know, what is my role? And I think my role is actually to work with him his family, his team, to actually minimise both his positive symptoms and his negative symptoms of his disease. It's actually to maximise his activation and enablement in his, own, um, in his own care, in his own life. And it's also to provide that sort of multidisciplinary, patient-centred, whole person medical, um, medical home. And in particular, I've been asked to speak up a little, sorry, I'll speak up a little. And in particular, um, it's important to understand that it's not just about his mental health. We understand people such as Amir actually have poorer physical health outcomes as well. So it's a matter of actually obviously dealing with his mental health, maximising his mental health, but also um, addressing issues that will end up with, um, so that he doesn't end up with increased chronic disease. So I will alert to the fact that he's more likely to have lower levels of exercise, risk factors for chronic disease, increased use of substances, etc. Um, so really essentially with this gentleman, we've got a young man who's at, uh, who is at risk as a res um, who is at risk as a result of significant and ongoing severe mental health problems, although he's stable, but whose negative symptoms of withdrawal and disengagement with positive aspects of his life and his being, his family, his work, studies, hobbies, exercise, have actually put him at greater risk. So those negative features actually can draw him into a greater risk paradigm of illness and unwellness in both negative and positive features through schizoaffective disorder. And so you have a constellation of, you know, so he comes back to me and as a GP, I notice a constellation of symptoms that are very much red flags. He's becoming increasingly withdrawn, his personal hygiene and um, grooming are becoming worse, he's mumbling to himself, he's less eye contact, his communication is becoming more perfunctory. And of particular concern, he's having increasing violent outbursts, focused on Aisha, starting to fire, coming to the attention of the police, 
and this renewed energy and interest in people dying. So there's a constellation of features that are making fairly wide at this stage. So I'm saying to myself, you know, what's actually happening in this situation? He was pretty bad before, but stable. Now he's getting worse, and there's fairly objective signs that he's getting worse. So is this his schizoaffective disorder worsening, and if so, why? Is it medication compliance? Is it substance use? Is it another chronic health problem that's actually compounding this? And also very importantly in this case, is he homicidal or a danger to others? And I'd be particularly worried about Aisha and her husband given what's happened at this stage. But I also need to think about the risks that he might be putting himself to um, and explicitly think about the risk of suicide and harm to himself. So um, I have a situation here where you know, I know him well, I've seen the changes and I'm worried. He's very susceptible from a mental health issues point of view, his history of violence, his lack of engagement in the meaningful world. And then he turns up in combat gear and he's elusive and he's involved in what seems like fairly fringe groups. And so now I'm extremely worried. And you know, given the issue and the potency and the tragedy of Christchurch, um, that that is a is a real fear. Um, so the question is, you know, what do I do? And I think that that's probably something we'll tease out more as a group. But I think as a GP, I'm very explicitly asking questions. I'd ask a range of closed questions and open questions. I'd speak with his psychiatrist and caseworker and mental health care team and others. I'd speak to him about his care being confidential unless I believe he's at risk to himself or others. I'd probably speak with Layla, and again, that's something we can explore later. But I certainly would not be looking after this by myself. I would need the the support, the perspective, the expertise of a range of people to actually assist me in this. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Ines. That's wonderful. And um, as you say, there's a whole lot of things there that I'd like to pick up on uh, when we get to questions and we can discuss as a group. But for now, I've got to keep an eye on the time, so I'm going to keep things moving along if I could. And uh, I'd like to hear uh, from Alfred, perhaps, if we could now, a little bit more about a kind of psychology perspective, but maybe with an emphasis, emphasis on um, how we might go about making decisions with regard to Emir. So um, over to you, Alfred. Good evening. My first task today is to tell you what a critical and skeptic cross-examiner might ask you next year, this time, if Emir goes on to do something bad. First, were you sensitive enough to identify the problem? Did you see the red flags? Did you know what questions to ask and information to collect? Did you have a framework to guide your decision making? Did you identify the issues you had to make a decision about, such as whether it's necessary to consult, to refer, or to make a report to the authorities? Did you use your decision-making framework to analyze the available information in a systematic way? Did, you, did your decision flow logically from the framework you used and the relevant information you had at the time? Finally, how did you and others respond after you made your decisions? So how did you respond? I cannot examine all the possible responses, but we usually want to consult or warn somebody in these circumstances, and that might involve violating our patient's privacy. So what are the rules here? The ground rule is, if you form the reasonable belief that there's a real risk of immediate irreversible harm, you face an emergency and you immediately do what is practical. Otherwise, you follow the policy, procedures, and protocols of the organization you work for. Or if you're in private practice, you follow your professional ethics, and they should be compatible with the Commonwealth Privacy Act. So the crux of this legislation is we need, to, we need consent to use information for a purpose that was not the primary purpose of collecting information unless we've got consent or it's impossible or impractical to obtain it, in which case we have a discretion to use it without consent in some circumstances. 
And there are two that are particularly relevant today. First, when a police officer calls you and asks you for information. The rule here is only provide information if he or she has a court order or warrant, unless there's an emergency, obviously. Second, if you reasonably believe that it's necessary to disclose information to prevent a serious threat to the life, health, or safety of any individual, or to the public health or safety, you can disclose information. The word reasonably is of paramount importance here because it says that there must be, they must objectively be tangible support beyond a mere belief or an assertion. So reasonably in law indicates the question is what a reasonable person in your position would have done under the circumstances. And that you can only find out by consulting other people, ideally without identifying your patient. The person you consult must be an appropriate person, and you must make a written record of the consultation as soon as possible about who you consulted, where and when, what was the tangible evidence you presented, what was the advice you received. So, in conclusion, Today, from your perspective, I think, would be to improve your sensitivity and to try and develop a decision-making framework that you can use and to understand how you could develop a network of appropriate people and organizations that you can consult or refer to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alfred. That was wonderful. And um, a whole lot of issues there that we will undoubtedly come back to. And I think I'll perhaps um, pin you down a bit when we get to questions about how those things might uh, apply in, in this particular case or in, in this space. But before we do that, can I just ask you a broader question? I suppose that um, when we do these, when, for many of us, and I suppose I am talking about myself here, when we do these, find ourselves in the situation of having to do this kind of assessment, we're sort of flying by the seat of our pants. Do you think that there's a place for us to be more conscientious about having policies and procedures in place to guide us through this kind of thing? Totally. I think, um, I think it's especially the case for private practitioners and organizations, obviously, as well. So I think the better the protocols, procedures, policies, the better for the organization or the individual. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK. Um, and I think that your slides actually provide the good beginnings of something like that. But um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Can I just say we are very frustrated with protocols and procedures and policies, I myself, but they're very good stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you know, I suppose um, you, you started off your talk, really, with this kind of in mind, but that um, we don't feel we need them until something goes wrong, and then we wish that absolutely. we had some kind of policy. So, yeah. yeah. All right, yep, thank you very absolutely. much indeed, Alfred. Thank you. We'll come back to you very shortly. But for the moment, let's move on to our final uh, panel member and get a specialist psychiatry perspective and perhaps a little bit about what the research and the kind of experts, con expert consensus tells us in this area. So Michelle, uh, if we could go over to you and uh, get, get your, uh, your views on this one. Over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Mark. I guess my um, overwhelming impression of this vignette was his, uh, how vulnerable this individual is. Um, He's vulnerable in uh, many, many ways, and I think there could have been any number of adverse outcomes in this particular case. But uh, I think it's reasonable to at least consider the, the risk of radicalisation in this particular case, given there are a number of indicators there. And I've put up there the definition of radicalisation. It's, uh, it's a process, the process by which people come to accept the use of violence promote their uh, ideology, their political, uh, religious, or uh, ideological views, basically. Views, basically. And the, the problem with this particular case is that, uh, as I said, there are a number of indications. And people who, who radicalise to violent extremism, we tend to uh, group under what we call, it's not working. Hang on a moment. I'll just go to the next slide there. Um, 
they tend to, basically people who are radicalising tend to have um, or display changes in various areas of their life, key areas of their life like their social relationships, their criminal activities and uh, their ideology. We can certainly see changes uh, in the social relationships here, particularly with Amir becoming more withdrawn, more isolated, uh, possibly having more of an online presence and certainly uh, rather estranged from family members. Um, ideology is unclear from this. He's a fairly secretive fellow by the sounds of things from the family's history. But if I was going to explore that, these are the sorts of questions I guess that we would uh, pursue. We'd be asking him, uh, I guess, about uh, his views, but also does he identify with extremists? And that's generally obtained from the sort of information he's collecting, the, the social media he's, and websites he's, he's uh, watching, um, people he's talking about, for instance. Um, rejecting the views of people who don't confirm their own views. So having radical views that don't fit with the rest of society, and perhaps the rest of his family, leading to the arguments that we've heard about. Uh, and joining activist groups or religious groups, for instance. And people who radicalise to violent extremism, as I've said before, are people who uh, can be categorised under this lone act of grievance fueled violence umbrella. So as you can see from that, lone act of terrorism sits there because very often personal grievances and injustices are more of a dominant factor than the ideology itself. Uh, so that's what they share in common. These aren't mutually exclusive types. And if you look at the top there, you see attackers of public figures, which are our fixated people, basically. The other thing that these groups uh, share in common are higher rates of mental illness than the general population. Um, and again, if we just look at the next slide, um, you can see there that uh, the rates of mental illness among lone actor terrorists are quite high at 40%, and we're talking about mental illness here. Uh, as opposed to the rest of the population. Certainly with uh, group actor terrorists, we're talking around 8% or so. So it's quite significantly different, but very similar to the other types of lone actor grievance fuel violence, our fixated loners, uh, our apolitical lone actor mass killers. So these are the people we just looked at, the workplace killers, the school killers, etc. cetera. Um, so we tend to fit this under lone actor grievance fuel violence. And um, this is just to sh sort of try and demonstrate that I'm not suggesting for a moment that mental illness causes terrorism or causes these lone actor attacks. Uh, terrorism's multi-determined. It's a complex, uh, complex uh, situation. Mental illness is only one contributing factor to that. But uh, it's, it's a contributing factor that we can do something about. And that's the really important key here. Uh, Emir appears to be vulnerable, he has mental illness. We need to be uh, looking at the mental illness in addition to obviously uh, addressing the other risks that, uh, that might be there. So I'll, um, I'll leave it there, but that's just a, a quick overview of um, the area. Uh, that's lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff I'd like to pick up on there, actually. But uh, if I can just uh, initially. You, you use the term, I think, lone actor or lone wolf. Um, would yes. you call? Would you suggest that Emir? Would you call Emir a lone wolf or a lone actor? Um, well, I wouldn't call him either at the moment. He's a potential lone actor, um, but uh, we use the term lone actor in preference to lone wolf. Uh, one of the things about lone actors is that they have a drive for notoriety. They really like to be recognised. And using terms like wolf suggests cunning and power and stealth. And we really don't need to indulge that with these particular people. So we use the term lone actor. The media tends to use lone wolf. It has more of a sensationalist kind of sound to it. But yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Michelle. So now let's uh, see if we can kick off a broader discussion. I'm going to invite the panel members to uh, just jump in and uh, uh, disagree or add an alternative perspective or just make a comment or whatever whenever they want. Um, but we're going to be driven largely by the questions that you as our participants have sent in to us. And I must say that I have been very impressed by the number and the quality of the questions that you've sent in for us uh, when, you, when you registered uh, for, for the webinar tonight. Um, and we will do our very best to get through them all, but please bear with us if we don't get to your particular question. If we think about the ones that you sent in, we can divide them into three broad categories. 
So the first theme is about um, a better understanding of the relationship between mental health and uh, grievance-fueled violence. The second theme is about assessment. What should we be looking for? What are the warning signs? And the third is really about intervention. What should we do? Uh, how can we manage this better, both as a clinician and perhaps as a, uh, from a broader systemic perspective? So my plan is to work through each of those three broad areas in turn, and then we've got something a little bit different to, uh, to finish up on. So let's start off with the first one. And I'm, I'm going to come to you first, if I can, Michelle. And um, I guess, you know, for, uh, we know that the majority of people with mental health problems are not violent, but clearly, um, or presumably, the fact that someone has a mental illness doesn't preclude them from being violent. No, no, and obviously there's many examples of that. Um, but, um, but, but certainly, you know, mental illness um, can make people vulnerable to, uh, because, you know, people, obviously, it's this, often the uh, associated vulnerabilities with mental illness as well that make them vulnerable to terrorist messaging. Um, so some people will be vulnerable and I think that uh, Ines went through the positive and the negative uh, features of mental illness and all of those things can, can certainly uh, make a person more at risk. But the, uh, the issue is that mental illness certainly doesn't preclude violent attacks uh, as we used to think in the old days. If anything, uh, if a person is mentally ill and they develop these sorts of views, it can actually provide more resolve. So having delusions might actually increase their resolve, for instance, to act on these beliefs. So that's, yeah. the, uh, that's the issue that people miss. Yeah. Sure, mm. sure, sure. Um, and you kind of answered this already, but I'll throw it back to you anyway. Um, why do you think it is that, that um, there are higher rates of mental health problems among, uh, among these kind of lone actors? Well, we, we don't precisely know, but we, uh, we do know that some people with mental illness, and as I said, with the sort of associated sort of social deprivation and stresses in their lives will be drawn to this sort of messaging as, a, as an apparent solution perhaps to their, to their problems. They so might be more vulnerable to the, to the propaganda, for instance, that terrorists put out. Um, so that's one reason, I guess, um, in a sense, group terrorists particularly group terrorist recruiters are not necessarily going to go out there and recruit people who are obviously mentally ill. Uh, and you know, it's, uh, I guess what we're also seeing is that group of mentally ill people who have delusions and are now incorporating terrorist themes into those delusions. And so that, that is also a problem. Uh, we're also seeing people who are feeling suicidal, perhaps homicidal, and uh, they see the media coverage of attacks and uh, it sort of offers some method solution of sorts. Um, so we see that copycat element as well in people who are already vulnerable. Yeah, you, you, um, you actually mentioned suicidal there as well as homicidal. I was going to bring Innes here, uh, in here actually if I could um, because a few people have asked about the connection between radicalization and self-injury and I might come back to Michelle's comment in a minute but for the moment as a GP Innes, would you um, would you have any concerns about Emir uh, harming himself? Did you pick up anything or, or what kind of indicators did you pick up that might worry you about um, Emir self-harming? Um, you've got a, I think if you've got a serious mental health problem, I mean the issue of suicide is one that's a fairly common prevalent issue and then you have somebody that has an underlying significant mental health problem um, and you have this world that's actually happening that you're not really sure as a practitioner what's happening in this private world. So I think you have to actually be attuned to the fact that he might actually have self-harm and be suicidal and in this case particularly that he actually might be homicidal or harm, particularly his sister Aisha because there's a number of factors I think that are um, a flag for both of those issues. And the issue about the, being violent is um, the objective markers seem to be violence towards the outside and outside people, Aisha and her brother, etc., violent outbursts. But one doesn't know what's happening internally in his world. And I think you need to explicitly think about it um, and screen for that. Yeah. Um... I want to come to you, Alfred, in just a minute and talk about what the um, 
ethical issues are when we think, as, as Dennis said, that, that he might be violent. But I'm going to throw another one at you, and I'm not sure if this is quite your domain, so don't hesitate to bat it back if it's not, Alfred. But um, uh, I'm interested in the role of drug and alcohol abuse, and, and or drug and alcohol use, perhaps not abuse, and, and, and our role, I suppose, in uh, how important it is that we ask those kinds of questions and, and whether that might play a role in, in triggering this kind of, um, well, uh, grievance-fueled violence. I'm not aware of any uh, research in that regard. I wonder if Michelle not going to be able to answer that one. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, specific uh, link. Uh, but Michelle, do you know? Well, if, if we're talking about lone act of grievance fuel violence, not including that fixated group, those attackers of public figures, who are a pretty pure bunch who don't tend to touch substances, um, we have we are seeing significant problems in that area, and um, so much so that in our um, fixated threat assessment centre, which deals with lone act of grievance fuel violence, we we uh, have alcohol and other drug services provided to those people. And certainly, a number of the attacks have uh, the attacks that we've seen, even in Australia, have um, have been associated with substance abuse as well. So. Uh, Certainly it's a disinhibitor, it's something that uh, some people will be actually psychotic when they commit those attacks. So it's uh, it's something that uh, we certainly factor in and it's one of the risk factors when we look at radicalisation and uh, violence. Um, I was going to, uh, since you used the term psychotic, I was going to ask mm -hmm. you, Michelle, why, whether or not there are uh, higher risks associated with certain disorders and, and that would be an obvious example. Do you think that people with psychosis are at higher risk, for example, than people with depression? Psychosis is a fairly general term. I, I certainly can uh, certainly say that people with uh, paranoid type psychoses are at increased risk of violence generally. And um, when we look at more recently, there's been um, studies of lone actor samples and the diagnoses that stand out in those samples are schizophrenia, delusional disorder and autistic spectrum as well. So they're the, they're the, and they are the standout diagnoses, uh, if you call autistic spectrum a diagnosis. But certainly they're uh, the problems that we're dealing with in uh, lone actor samples. Okay. Um, let me come back to you, Ines, if I could, because there's an interesting question here that I hadn't thought of, but I think it's worth exploring. And I'm wondering whether in primary care settings in particular, but possibly in specialist mental health settings as well, that um, there's a danger that if we identify someone as having a serious mental illness, that that might actually uh, act as a barrier to recognizing sort of extremist ideologies and potential for violence. The idea that um, we're too ready to perhaps put it down to the illness, that it's just because he's got schizophrenia or whatever. Uh, do you think it might be a barrier or is that an un un unnecessary concern? I think it's a concern and I think that it's a concern in a whole lot of aspects of uh, clinical care. I think that sometimes when you have a diagnosis, you keep going down that path of diagnosis. That's, a, that's true across a whole lot of aspects of clinical care. And you need to be able to sit outside sometimes, really look at the clinical picture and say periodically, does this actually fit the picture? So I think that it is something you need, absolutely need to be aware of. And I think that you need to be aware of those, the things that Michelle's talking about, because there is some blurring here. And in general practice in primary care, you often actually don't have a very clear diagnosis with things. We're used to, as GPs and primary care professionals, we're often used to looking after um, things that haven't quite resolved, so ambiguous circumstances and still managing them. So in the case of EMEA, you need to be in a situation where you are managing the situation, managing it safely, thinking about a range of things before you've actually got oops, a clear diagnosis of what um, these escalating symptoms are actually due to. Okay, okay. All right, so I want to move on to, to um, look at the assessment issues, but but it, it seems then what we're saying is that um, mental health problems in grievance fueled violence are very common, but they're not essential, and uh, that this stuff might occur in the absence of those kinds of problems. As a kind of, um, I don't know, bridging question, because I don't know where else to put it, uh, Alfred, I wonder if I could ask you to comment on this. And again, I, I forgive me, because I might be being unfair throwing this one at you again, so just bat it back if you're, if you're not too sure about it. 
But it just does strike uh, me from various news reports and the amount of media coverage that we're getting nowadays that these kind of incidents of lone act of violence are uh, or have been on the increase in recent years. Do you, do you think that that's true? Are they increasing or are we just more aware of them? And if they are increasing, have you got any idea why? I think they are increasing, and I think the copycat uh, element is probably um, a reason for that. I think what we're seeing is, I think mental illness play out in a social me uh, milieu, and we've kind of grown used to this terrorism over the last 20 years or so, and obviously it affects people with a mental illness, and it will affect people, especially if they're paranoid schizophrenic. So I think there is probably an increase. I think there's also an increase of using motor cars and things like that to commit crimes. And uh, it's once again what people see on television. And there's a lot of coverage of these things on television. It gets a lot of TV attention. Mm, absolutely. And as you say, that kind of uh, potentially fuels the sort of copycat, uh, the copycat kind of stuff. Um, and I think, the, yeah. Yeah. Copy, copycats may be not the right word, but it's kind of like it's become very common. So it's very much up in people's minds um, and also people with a mental illness. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And of course, I, I don't think I particularly want to go down this path now, but, um, but there has been a lot of suggestions that perhaps the quality of care that we have for our seriously mentally ill, mentally Ill uh, is not, well, it's different to the way it was. In some ways, it's much better. But it is, uh, we don't have the kind of institutional care that we used to have where people could be uh, looked after. And, and I don't know, as I say, maybe that's too difficult to go there, unless you want to comment on that. Uh, well, well, I think deinstitutionalization has been coming for many years. And in some countries, it's very advanced. I, I think it's one factor. I don't, wouldn't like to say that's a crucial factor. But it, right. obviously, it's, it's probably one of the issues. Okay, thanks Alfred. I'd like to come back to you, Michelle, if I could. And, and let's talk about, we're now really getting into the idea of assessment and, and, and uh, how we're, what, what we need to be asking and so on. Um, do you think that there's any way that, uh, any way to identify whether Emir is actually planning a violent attack? You know, what, what kind of signs might we be looking for? Well, there's unfortunately no way to predict future violence, as you know, but um, but certainly there are a number of factors in this particular case that are known to be associated with violence in these sorts of contexts. Uh, his history of violent outbursts is certainly one of those. Um, his uh, poor social adjustment, uh, the difficulties he has there, and the, um, I guess, underachievement in life and general disenfranchisement. Um, we don't know about many other factors that might contribute to that, but. Uh, on their own, and I should say as well, of course, he's, uh, he does, as I said, seem to have collected a lot of wounds along the way, so he has injustices perceived or otherwise, uh, which stem from you know, the bullying in the early years and uh, the failure to achieve as a result and so on. So those things together certainly point to uh, a, you know, certainly a, a greater likelihood of violence. Um, but Really, the, the best, one of the best predictors available to us at the moment actually comes from these people themselves because over 80% of these people are actually telling other people about their violent intentions before they commit the attack. Uh, and when I say other people, I'm talking about people around them, family members, colleagues, online contacts. Um, and that's, that's great from the point of view of uh, prevention. Uh, obviously, that's an avenue for us to find out about these things before they happen. But it does rely on these people, obviously, then passing the information on to the authorities. Yeah, yeah, which is, uh, well, let's hold that for a moment because I think it's a really important point and I want to talk more about families and the involvement of families and so on, but uh, it's, a, it's a very important point. Um, Innes, you, you were worried about Emir and you, you said the last time you were talking something about the fact that you were worried about his homicidal tendencies. Were, were there any particular things that you, uh, you, you know, that worried you in particular about the, the risk of violence towards other people? Um, I think it's fair, well, for me it seems fairly clear the fact that he's actually um, tried to hurt Aisha again. I think he um, um, tried to light the car of her, of her husband, increasingly violent outbursts. 
along with this sort of paradigm of increasing withdrawal and being more evasive. So there is that sort of, I would say that there's, in the way I read his story, there's the three phases. There's the, the post-acute care phase where he has the residual schizophrenia, then there's that middle phase, and then there's a the very worrying phase at the end. And certainly in that middle phase, I'd be ringing up his psychiatrist saying, look, I think he's getting worse from my perspective. He's showing um, more positive features, more negative features, and in addition to that, he's actually got some violent features here, and I'd like a pretty prompt assessment of this person. Um, and I'd, so that would be, I would actually be pulling in the levers of the other care team and the, the expertise by the case management, um, the psychiatrists and the, the mental health team to actually assist in that. And as I said in the, in the first instance, they all have their own lenses and have had their own experiences. So it's about patching together um, a look, at, a more fulsome look at Amir, and along with that is actually the perspective that his mother brings, because because there is no doubt that his mother is getting another perspective at home, and it will also be extremely worried about presumably her daughter. Okay, I agree entirely. Look, there's a whole lot of stuff there. I really do want to come back to this idea of bringing other professionals in and also engaging the family, but uh, I'm going to put it on hold for the moment because we'll talk about that and in, in what we actually do about it. Let's just stick on assessment if I can. Um, and, and perhaps I'll just go to you, Alfred, if I could, uh, again. And um, I guess this is an over-idealistic question, but you talked about having policies and procedures in place before. Um, is, is it feasible to talk about a kind of checklist that people should be going through uh, to identify the risk of, of uh, violent behavior? Or is that uh, too sort of structured, too rigid? I don't think there are any risk prediction instruments that we can use in this area, but I think having a formal assessment uh, structure is always good. And uh, it helps, uh, it's what I call, uh, you know, when I refer to the decision-making um, framework, it just helps one organize your ideas and it's a systematic way of looking at the material that you're collecting and making sure that you collect the right in information. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, Michelle, if I can bring come back to you, and um, if we just leave um, radicalization, to, uh, sorry, if we leave mental health to one side at the moment, can you um, just comment more generally on the potential relationship between radicalization and the potential for violence? Michelle? Yes, uh, I mean, as I said, uh, radicalisation is a process. Uh, ultimately, it leads to violent extremism. That's the direction it's headed. Um, so that is about the person then conducting some violent attack or um, supporting someone else to do that or some other form of violence or disruption, bomb hoaxes, that sort of thing. So um, that's the path people are on. And they, they get to the point of violence because they... Uh, come to a point where it's justified in their mind. Their beliefs actually justify violence as the only solution. So that's it's part and parcel of the, the process. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on then and talk about what we're going to do about it. So we've identified that um, Emir is, is, is at risk. We don't know whether he's going to act on it or not, but we've identified that he's at risk. Uh, Ines, I'll bring you in again here if I could. Um, because you've mentioned the family a number of times and I now want to give you free head to have a go at it. So um, if we start with Layla, because you talked about possibly bringing his mum, bringing Emir's mother in, um, can you just talk a little bit about how you might make that decision and when you might make that decision? And that's a, that's a big deal, isn't it, to, to be asking his mother in? It is a big deal. Um, it's a bigger deal if it happens without his consent, clearly. And so the... The issue about, um, Layla is obviously a very big protective factor in his life, is obviously somebody who very, cares about him very deeply and provides a lot of care provision, and is also somebody that can give you a perspective of what's happening in his life outside the room and the, the visitor that you have. So I think it's important in principle um, to actually have her involved, both from an information point of view, but also from a care provision point of view. Um, by and large, as a general practitioner, when you do have a long-term relationship with somebody, that's something that actually happens. It happens as in a conversation with a patient 
where you say, hey, um, next time can you bring your mum in or um, you see a mother in, a, in another situation because she comes in for another thing and she opens up the conversation and tells you what is actually happening at home. Clearly in those, in the second instance, you have to be very clear about the confidentiality that you are actually providing because Amir is an adult, he's not strictly under the care of uh, Layla and so you can gather information quite easily in that sort of scenario but you clearly have to be very cautious about providing information to Layla about her son unless that's obviously with consent of her son or there's other, mis or there's other circumstances where you feel it's warranted. And well, there's some of the... Sorry. No, no, it's okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, it, it, it's a very interesting question, and I was going to bring Alfred in because he's our kind of expert on mm. professional ethics. Um, what, what comments would you have about that, Alfred, in terms of involving Layla? Uh, as, as, as Innes says, you know, if, if Amir is quite happy to give absolute consent, then I guess that's a bit simpler. But otherwise, uh, what are the ethics of involving Layla or perhaps other family members? Yeah, it's very difficult because in a way, uh, this GP seems to have a fairly good relationship and a long relationship with the patient. So you don't want to go and do something to ruin that relationship. And on the other side, obviously, you've also got the ethical issue of not breaching confidentiality. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a very difficult one. And it would depend on the circumstances. I think if you're sitting with what you really consider to be an emergency, uh, it may be uh, you may be uh, justified to actually violate his confidentiality and speak to his mother. Um, but one's got to be, you know, it's very difficult to answer a hypothetical question about this one. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, because also, of course, there, there, there is potential to bring in other family members as well. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in um, Innes' comment that what, what if she sees the mother in another setting and the mother is telling her things? Where, where, where does that go if, if mum says, you know, I think that he's planning something? Or he's... I, think, I think one would sit down with mother and work out a management plan. How are you going to deal with this? Because in a way, um, mother is obviously looking for you to do something. But, uh, and, and it's a kind of like a cry for help, really, in a certain sense. So, so you've got to do something about it. You can't, cannot ignore it. And I, if it comes out later that you did ignore it, I don't think it will be very well received. So I think the, the answer is sitting down with mother and trying to w work out a way what to do. Just purely on, on what I read here, I think uh, the, the most obvious thing would be to consider uh, readmission into a psychiatric hospital and maybe to try and ask mum whether she would be happy to assist with that. And that may be one way of dealing with the situation. Uh, I think if you've got a, a very experienced GP working with a client over a patient over a long period of time, sitting down with a family member, um, they could probably try and get a meal back into a, in a, to a psychiatric hospital. Let me just take you back about um, 30 seconds. Uh, you said that if we don't do anything, then uh, it's not going to look very good or whatever. But can I push you a bit harder on that? Um, if we if we look at this particular case with the kind of, it's not black and white, it's not clear cut, but there are enough warning signs. If we don't do anything, uh, do you think we're at risk there of accusations of professional misconduct or even perhaps legal sanctions? <sighs> A very difficult one, and I think this is where you, I, if I was a, a, the GP, I would want to consult somebody like Michelle. Um, and as I said in my overheads, uh, not uh, without identifying my my pa patient, and get a second opinion on this one. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take this on my own bat. And it does come back to uh, Innes' comments about the importance of, um, yeah, not doing it on your own, of engaging other professionals. And I'll come back to you, Innes, actually. Uh, there is something else I want to ask you, but Innes, but um, is there a, do you want to add anything to that about the importance of involving some colleagues, perhaps, you know, the, the, the psychiatrist and, and other key workers? Um, how would you decide that that's an appropriate thing to do? Is that pretty routine for you, or would that be unusual? 
Uh, no, I think it'd be fairly routine. I mean, if you've got any clinical scenario, especially if you've got a care team around him already, he has a mental health team, you're doing shared care with him essentially. Um, so that phone call would have, been, would have happened fairly early on. As soon as he noted a, a clinical deterioration fairly soon, you would have rung up and said, hey, um, things aren't looking so good at my end. So could you please see him fairly soon? Perhaps it's a medication issue. Hopefully you've got some information to be able to provide them so that there's a, um, a better care algorithm, you know, a more fulsome picture of perhaps why this might have occurred, whether it's adherence to medication, whether it's actually substance use, as Michelle was talking about before, or whether you say, well, I actually don't know what's happened, but things seem to be getting worse. So that's a fairly common, that's a very common situation. I think that the issue is really when you get to that point in, which is um, how quickly do I need to respond and will he take part in this assessment? So that's when you actually start having that think about um, how soon do I need to respond to this before he's potentially at danger to himself or to others. And that's when you start having that think about does he need an assessment order? if he won't do that voluntarily. And as um, Alfred was saying, you know, in that situation it's much, much more preferable to have it in a voluntary setting in the community. And so that's probably something you ring up your you know, learned colleague who has much more experience in this psych team and say, look, this is the outcome we need. How can we best get to there? Um, okay, I'm jumping around a bit, but while you're there, in this, if I can come back to Layla, and your comment about, um, you know, that I might see Layla in another setting as, as a GP, I might see her in her own right or whatever. If, if she does come to you first asking for advice, um, do you have ideas about what you would advise her to do when she's worried about her son? I think that there are some principles that Alfred actually outlined really well, which is that first thing is that you want to maintain a really strong relationship. Um, and a trusting relationship with Amir. Because that's actually fairly crucial in you being able to assess him and help him therapeutically, but also assess his risks moving forward. So I think that that's really crucial. And um, the, obviously the, um, the discussion you have with Layla, as much as you can, you don't actually want to affect a negative relationship with Amir. So if you can actually bring Amir along with you, in this discussion, in some ways, I'm not saying physically in the same room, but if you can involve Amir and say, hey Amir, I'd like to have a chat to your mum about this or your family, I think things are about at home, I'm seeing her soon, do you mind if I have a chat to her about you? If you have that sort of relationship with him, it's, it's, you know, um, it's much better from your point of view um, and it's also much better from a relationship point of view. And then you can actually discuss that with both Amir and with Layla. There are clearly circumstances where um, that's not going to happen. And then in the Layla situation, you need to decide, is this a, are you going to be in some ways a receptacle for information so that you help get information to get a clearer picture of Amir? Um, and how much of his, um, because you don't want to necessarily break his confidentiality. It doesn't mean you won't because there are some circumstances, as Alfred said, where this is actually a uh, risk framework decision making process. Um, the other thing I would say though, you've asked specifically about how I would help Layla. And I think that in helping Layla, I would actually first try to elucidate what her issues are. And I suspect her issues are firstly about Aisha, so I think that that's actually really crucial here, is her concern about um, potential threats and problems with Aisha, and clearly actually what's happening with Amir. And that discussion about how much I can tell her about Amir really involves my relationship with Amir. I'm sorry it's so um, muddy, that discussion, but it often is a, a muddy yeah. landscape that we're talking about. Yeah, no, I understand entirely. It is a very, um, it's a very complex area, isn't it, without any, any simple answers. Um, Michelle, can I put you on the spot then for some simple answers? Um, <laughs> what, what's... Um, uh, it, in broad terms, what does the evidence tell us, or if we haven't got the evidence, then perhaps the expert consensus, tell us about what the interventions are going to be with someone like Emir? What, what kind of interventions do you think have the highest chance of success? 
well, we're making assumptions, I suppose, about what we've found here. But you know, I'm I'm putting my money on this fellow having uh, deteriorating, in, you know, mentally and needing some um, mental health care at this point in time. Uh, and I think that uh, we need to be able to identify that there are other processes going on. It may be that he is radicalising, and that's something a little outside the understanding of uh, uh, of mental health services. What we need them to be able to do is to treat this man, but we also need to be able to look at all the other pieces of the puzzle, some of which mental health services don't have. Um, in the sorts of services that are developing now as joint services with police and, and other agencies, we can start to uh, look at the extent of the problem uh, by, for instance, actually knowing what he's talking about on social media, for instance. Um, who he's talking to, uh, what their backgrounds are, what their influences are. So these are all things that are really important to understanding the risk he poses at this point in time and whether or not information needs to be shared at some level. Um, and I think no one is asking mental health services to do that. Uh, what we're asking mental health services to do, I guess, is to do what they do best, which is to treat mental illness. Um, but for us all to work together to share that responsibility yeah. Okay. Um, just while I've got you, um, someone's asked what I think is an important question, but I'd just like to preface it with a reminder of what I said at the beginning, and that is that the vignette that we're using tonight of, of Amir is not only entirely fictitious, but it was deliberately designed to challenge the myths, to challenge the stereotypes and that kind of thing. Uh, but having said that, I, I wondered whether or not we might look at involving, if someone's playing with their microphone, that's it. I wonder if we might look at involving um, sort of culturally appropriate organizations within the community. To what extent do we try and engage community organizations in helping us to manage someone like Amir? Yes. I mean, when we have an issue like this, um, we, have, uh, we have services to essentially help them disengage from this path so that they don't progress to violence. And uh, we draw on all the agencies that we need. and, and the, and uh, obviously their, their cultural, uh, cultural associations, et cetera, um, employment agencies. And there's any number of agencies that might be appropriate. And it's not a one size fits all. But it's about building skills. We've got a very disenfranchised uh, young man who's underachieved in life, who's got lots of resentment around that. And uh, you know, we need to, as it is said, try and build a life again, a meaningful life for this fellow. And um, that will include, obviously, uh, you know, multicultural agencies, etc. Yeah. OK. Before I let you go, because I, I really want to actually move on to something else now. But before I do, a very legitimate question that people have asked is, is there any training that they can get? Are there any training courses or programs that clinicians can go to to help skill up in these kinds of areas? They are being run in a number of um, different mental health disciplines at the moment, and uh, they they do come along. But at the moment, we also have uh, some excellent fact sheets that have come out from um, the Department of Home Affairs has put those out with lots of expert um, involvement. Uh, I find them very well written, very easy uh, reading, and um, I think a minimum for uh, health professionals in terms of what they need to be able to recognise. So they're available on uh, on the website there as well. Good, and we'll talk about them in a minute when we talk about mm. the resources. Mm. I'm going to throw it back to you, Ines, if I could, and I'm going to ask for the quickest answer possible, I'm afraid. <laughs> and that is that uh, our first rule is to do no harm. Do you think that there's any risk that intervening with someone like Amir uh, might actually make things worse, might even increase the risk? I think that there is. I think that there's always a risk that intervening will disrupt your relationship with him, perhaps put a disruption between his relationship and his mother, and further disenfranchising from a protective system would put him at greater risk. However, I think it's fairly clear from this case that this is escalating and something needs to be done, and it needs to be done from a multi-pronged approach. Okay. All right, thanks very much to everybody. I, I'd like to just move on and uh, do this uh, last bit. And that is, um, what we've done is to um, identify some of the really common myths that we think people have about um, grievance-fueled violence. 
and uh, we've got them up on the, on, the, on the screen here. So what we're going to ask you to do is to um, vote on these. I'm going to ask um, Renan in a minute uh, at Redback to start the poll and ask you to vote on which one of these you would most like to see covered. So if you could start the poll, please, Renan. And uh, if you uh, participants could please um, just vote for which one that you think you would like to see uh, discuss perhaps which one you think might be one of the more widely believed ones and then we'll get um, well we'll get our panel and particularly perhaps Michelle to address those so is everybody pressing buttons I can't see anything happening but maybe that's just my end so uh, you've just got a few seconds left if you'd like to vote for one of those myths to uh, be explored click your button now and I think we'll close it off uh, Renan did we get any responses there? I didn't see any on my screen have you got any if you have pop, pop them up okay uh, all right just bear with me out there um, because the numbers are flashing in front of my eyes here um, okay so let's go with that one that um, the, the top one that we've got is that radicalization is always linked to religion. Um, Michelle, can I turn to you and just ask you uh, what you would say about that? Uh, is it true that radicalization is always linked no, to religion? No, no. It's um, look. There's a whole spectrum of uh, of extremist ideologies out there. We have you know left wing wingers, right wingers, various religious. Uh, ideologies but we also have nationalists and separatists and anarchists and, and so it goes on so it's not always linked to religion at all it's really a political communication right um, does it, are, are any of our other panelists want to comment on that one I'm going to pick up on the others as well but um, any other other panelists want to comment on that one let me then um, pick up on number four because I think that came in two according to my numbers uh, which is an interesting one. ASIO has unrestrained power to arrest those they believe may be radicalizing. And uh, yes. <laughs> is, is, is that true, Michelle? <laughs> ASIO has surveillance powers. They don't have arrest powers. If they need to arrest, that's something that uh, the state, territory or federal police will do. But ASIO, like, uh, like the state uh, counter-terrorist services, really don't want to be arresting people who are radicalising unless they're committing offences. Uh, really the, the push nowadays is on prevention, it's early intervention, prevention uh, from that course and, and obviously stopping the progression to an attack. Uh, and we have, you know, we are increasingly, uh, services and, and resources are being put into that uh, very approach with, um, with uh, services that help to disengage people from that path. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. And I'm relying on Innes and Alfred to just jump in if there's any comments they'd like to make on any of these. Um, what about that first one? And certainly, as a clinician, it doesn't sound right to me. Um, <laughs> Heaven help us if it is right, that's all yeah. I can say. Uh, yeah, no, it's, um, the, uh, there's a lot of radical thoughts out there. I think we've all had radical thoughts. So you only need to step onto a university campus and there's radical thoughts out there. But of course, not everybody believes that uh, violence is the solution to those. Well, violence is the way that uh, their beliefs should be promoted. So um, it's much, you know, obviously radical thinking is much more common than actual violent extremism. And indeed, I think I'm right in saying that, well, I don't want to get into sticky ground here, but that um, uh, thoughts about violence or thinking about violence is very much more common than actually acting on it. A absolutely. lot of people might. Yeah, you'd agree with that? Yeah. I would, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes, mm. yeah. Uh, and then the final one was then uh, that you have to be in a group to be radicalized. You can't be radicalized if you're not in a group. Is that true? Well, not, no, no. I mean, obviously, people can self-radicalise. It's easier, I guess, to be in a group. Uh, groups offer a lot of advantages um, and uh, they help overcome some of the hurdles to actually, uh, to, to physical violence, but, uh, but people can self-radicalise. It's just that lone actors, um, even though they're described as lone actors, very often do have links with a group or have had links with a group who've helped them to, with the radicalisation or planning attacks, etc. Yeah, 
Okay. All right. So um, there are a whole lot of myths around, and I know that one of the um, one of the fact sheets that you mentioned earlier that I think is in our resources thing that people can look at mm. later ha has a longer list of myths and, and, and mm. yeah things that people believe. Okay, yeah. the clock is ticking away, and we've just about run out of time. So to finish, I would like to ask each of you whether you have any final take-home messages for our participants, any uh, any final points that you'd like to leave our participants with, and I might start with you, Ines. And anything, any final points that you'd like to make? Uh, you're on mute. I think you're on mute. I am on mute. Thank you for that, Mark. I think from a mental health wellbeing point of view, think about both the positive and negative symptomatology and also think about and work on protective factors. I would say that would be one you know, or two issues that are really important. Another issue is actually to work within people to actually activate them in their own care, which is linked to that. I'd also say raise your point, Mark, about sometimes when things aren't going along the trajectory that's expected to actually just step outside and think, have I got this diagnosis right? What's actually happening here? And importantly, how can I engage other people and other services to help me um, help this person best? Okay, good. Thank you very much, Ines. Alfred, any final take-home messages for our participants? Uh, you're on mute as well, I think, Alfred. Are you on mute? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, I think it's important right. to, to appreciate that chemo is a risk to others, especially physically, even if there's no cure of the lesion here. And that as uh, mental health practitioners, we should be very aware of our duty nowadays to actually also assist the society in prevention of harm. And he is clearly very ill, and as such, that's where we are experts at, and that's where our first focus should be. How do we actually stabilize him? Because once we've stabilized him, the problem might even go away. I mean, it's never going to go totally, but that's, I would think, we should focus, first focus. Yeah, yep. I'm afraid that we you're breaking up a little bit, and I'm not sure whether that's your headset or whatever, but we did get the gist of that. We got most of it. Um, so thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Alfred. And finally, uh, Michelle, just check that you're not on mute, and then uh, <laughs> hand over to you if I could for some final comments. Yeah, again, it's a, it's this is a complex, multi-determined kind of problem. But you know, mental illness isn't the sole cause or driver of this. Uh, but we have to realise in this new age of um, you know terrorism, if you like, there are increased rates of lone actor attacks for various reasons. They have higher rates of mental illness. Uh, Mental health professionals, GPs, other health professionals can obviously do something about that. As Alfred just said, some of the time that's all that will be, need to be done. Uh, but we can, you know, it, it is something that is, as I said, a shared responsibility. It's no longer just about law enforcement and intelligence agencies. We have something to offer that the police haven't got. So that's the message I guess I'd like to give at this stage. Yeah. Absolutely, and yeah. I think it's a, it's a very important uh, it's a very important message to leave on, isn't it? Really, that we all share a responsibility, particularly as mental health mm. professionals, but mm. but the whole community perhaps shares a responsibility in trying to to minimise this. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. Um, just a couple of closing comments here, and a reminder that uh, there are some great resources available. We will, or MHPN, will send you the link to the resources. Um, it was in a few days at the, uh, after the webinar, and I do encourage you to look at it because um, in particular the fact sheets that Michelle referred to I thought were particularly good. These are prepared by the Department of Home Affairs and, and targeted at different health professions with some really useful information. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that when you've got time over the coming day. Um, I'd also encourage you, if I could, please to make sure that you complete the feedback survey before you log out. Um, but for now, uh, I think it just uh, remains for me to say thank you very much indeed. Thank you especially to all our panelists, to Innes, to Alfred, and to Michelle. Thank you. thank you very much for what I think was a, a great webinar. I was very pleased with it. And thank you also to all of you who participated in the webinar. Uh, thank you for your engagement and your involvement. It really makes a big difference to us. So 
So I hope that you found it valuable. Thanks again to everybody, and good night. Thank you. Good night. Yeah.